Okay. Because they've got a picture of us. Yeah, so I'm Samir. Samir Barman. Well, BCSF. June Kleider. Grant Bowman. Yeah, you're in Carol Reed Silver. Alex Kleider. Hillary Naylor. Bruce Bakey. Aaron Borden. Okay. We're all old PCSF. So we've got uh, Bruce who's going to talk about the, uh, the Rachel server and other things related, solar stuff perhaps, your experiences around the world. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got a few slides on the uh, ExoViz the uh, visualization analytics stuff. And then we got a copy of Internet in a Box um, here. I just made a copy of it. So that's 760 gigs, took 21 hours to copy. Um, and then I, I got a stack of slides from uh, from the guy who runs the project, Braddock. Uh, and so maybe I can run through some of those to just highlight what, what's on there. And I guess Mike is going to record it using a recording utility. Okay, perfect. All right. You want to start, and then we'll see if the audio works. Okay. Can um, you guys hear Bruce? So at the last meeting, I introduced you to uh, uh, this project called Rachel. And what it is is it's a small offline server that runs off of an SD card on a small Raspberry Pi computer. And so, uh, essentially, you could take this to a school, and, and it provides uh, it with offline content, and the power use is about the same amount as a cell phone, so it's very low power, so it can easily be put into a solar system or, or, or any kind of uh, battery or electrical system. Um, so, the, the organization that this spun out of was actually, it was started by a group of Cisco engineers. They actually went to build a network in remote Ethiopia and realized it was a lot harder to build the to get the internet to the school than bring something like this. So they really viewed how do we get inexpensive uh, solution for offline content that can go into a school, and so this is what they came up with. Kind of a, a long story. Uh, there was a that group of engineers. They went to do another installation in Sierra Leone and. And uh, one of the, the original engineers brought her boyfriend, and he got so excited and saw what had happened. He formed an organization called uh, World Possible to carry on, just not having this as a little side project of a bunch of Cisco engineers, but to actually uh, grow it. And so he's he's actually one of the, the uh, he's also part of Mission Social here on the fifth floor. Um, I just. I joined their board in December to help them guide them on the content that they have and how they support this. So they currently have a version that's in English and in uh, Spanish. They have uh, quite a few large number of schools in uh, Guatemala and Honduras. Um, but I'm working with them uh, on a French version at the, at the moment. Your, your laptop or tablet to uh, the SSID is RPI, and from there you can actually look at the content that's uh, on the server. So, we, we, do we have Wi-Fi here? Yes. What's the, what's well, if you want to connect to this as an offline server, you can connect to RPI. Separate. Separate from going up to... So this is not connected to the Internet. This is a standalone content. Content. So, so, so here I am on my X01. How do I, what should I do? Um, well, you can connect to RPI. Go to, go to your neighborhood and find RPI, I think. Yeah. So Bruce, that you can just buy a unit, plug it in, and yes. power this, okay. Um, in fact, we awesome. have a, a solution that we've uh, found to run um, to run uh, three uh, OLPCs and this as a package solution. Oh, okay. Hmm. I just wanted to uh, add, uh, I mean, the Raspberry Pi version is one. They, uh, they have a download that you can put into sort of any Apache server, and we've started to, to integrate it into uh, XSCE uh, as well. I'm just in the process of working on a playbook. I've done the 
the uh, 32 gig download from uh, World Possible, and uh, uh, we're hoping to have a playbook as an alternative way of having some of this content. So that's that's uh, to add the content from World Possible onto the XSCE, right? Correct. Okay. So that the so that XSCE would serve it up. Uh, instead of the, I mean, you, obviously the Raspberry Pi is a, a dedicated uh, solution that is very low power. But uh, if you wanted to incorporate it into the school server, then uh, we need to create a playbook so that you could install the uh, the interface to it. You still need to get the uh, the download, which is about 18 gigs from uh, if you download. From world possible uh, that's compressed. Okay. So once I connect to our pi, what am I going to? Uh, 192, 168, 10.1. Okay. You're already there. I got it. <laughs> yeah. What's after 168? 10.1. 10.1. 10.1. 10.1. Uh, there it is. If you guys can see it. There. Okay. So, Wikipedia for schools. Yeah. So, if you if you uh, page down, you can see all the content that's on there. Then. So correct me if I'm wrong, but Wikipedia for Schools is a curation of about 6,000 articles. Is it something I know? I know it's not the full wiki. Correct. 6,000. 6, okay. Experian, Experian Health Guides, Healthcare, and Medicine. And that image can be downloaded from the net. Yes. Yeah. Now one of the things we're going to do different with the French version is actually where you can select which ones you want. Because right now Rachel is set up where you download the whole. 32 gigs that go on the card, and, and for the French version, we're working with the Orange Foundation to make it selectable on what content you actually want. Hmm. So can I uh, click on Math Expression, for example, and, and see what that's in? Yes. Yeah, but a lot of these things. Um, one one question, you know, we always have in the field is, uh, so it works, you know, it's supposed to work in a certain way, <clears throat> but once you take it into a location, it's always a question of load. Uh, how many units can connect to it and you know access the content simultaneously? If it's serving a bunch of files, you know, what's the upper limit to that? Those, those kind of things. That would be interesting to see, you know, how far this will go before it breaks. <laughs> well, I know, for example, in Micronesia, we're running this on an Intel Nook okay. because yeah, yeah. we had five schools, each with uh, with eight computers, and the uh, and the Raspberry Pi was not enough to, for that. So we actually upgraded to an Intel Nook that has an i3 processor, and that's been more than fast enough. So the Pi was not enough for eight computers. For eight to ten, yeah. Eight to ten. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that would make sense. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the Raspberry Pi is great because it's cheap and all of that stuff, but once you put it out on the field, that's always a big question, which is how quickly do you hit the limit? Right. Well, or also, you could have eight of them for the price of the Nook. Huh? You could have eight of them for the price of the Nook. So. Eight of them for the price of a Nook. Yeah. So then you would have to manage eight different machines. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Nooks are actually dropped in price a lot. So. How much are those now? Down to $130. How do they stand up to the, the elements and the handling in the field? Which? The, the Raspberry Pi. Well, there's no fan or anything. Yeah. So, you know, it really depends on the case that you put it in. Uh -huh. um, and the milk that you're running, how long has that been done? That's been running over a year now. And no trouble with. Uh, the, 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 the trouble I foresee on that is the first version of the Nooks had a fan in them. Oh, okay. And the new versions are all passive cool. So 
Um, we're watching to see how much stuff gets sucked into it. <coughs> okay. How much stuff gets sucked into the nook? Or into the, the fan, thing? yeah. I thought there was no fan. The new version doesn't have a fan. The original one that we installed in Micronesia, mm -hmm. the first version that came out from Intel, had a fan in it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and how are you powering this one? The one that you have, the nook? Uh, it's powered, uh, it's uh, a grid with battery backup. Grid with battery backup. Yeah, so that's the other thing, you know, I wanted to sort of, since we're meeting here and you, you know, you've done a fair bit of work in this space was to hear more about the power side of things. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure Richard's theory is interested in some of that as well. Um, the only experience I have is with the project I have in India where we have, um, it's basically like a, a UPS type supply uh, with, with uh, two batteries and then some kind of AC grid powers it. On the AC end, we've got regular AC from the grid. We've got a diesel generator. We've got some solar stuff. It's not very clean in terms of how it gets charged. But that's sort of been holding up the server for us um, about eight to 10 hours a day. Uh, but outside of that, you know, I, I just want to hear what your experience is out of that. OK. Um, well, let me get, we've been using this uh, product from Phoenix International. Let me oh, get it. Let me show you what what we've been testing. Okay. Um, Mike has some questions in the chat. I think he just wants some photos for the video. Oh, okay. Photos from here. There. Uh, he says of uh, like the EXO on the RPI site, or oh. basically the. Oh. So I've got it. Up. I've got Math Expression, Math Tutor Online, and uh, I've got the graphs, the coordinate plane. Why? And it says lesson objective. This lesson shows you the basic parts of the coordinate plane. Why learn this? The plane is one of the most important idea behind graphics. A lot of mathematical ideas are created. It also means that if you're taking up math. Stuff. Study tips, these are the parts of the plane you should uh, remember. So it looks really nice. It doesn't say who wrote this. Wow. Well, I want to do that at home. So one of the products that we've been testing is, is this uh, from Phoenix International. It's oh, designed in San Francisco. What, what is it? It's a battery system and a solar panel. Yeah. And so we've been using this for our tablet deployments where we need to have uh, power in a school um, for uh, and so we, we have tested this, and we can run up to six tablets. We've been working with Phoenix to remove the uh, cigarette-type lighter connections and go all with six uh, uh, mm -hmm. USB so that it, uh, mm -hmm. so we don't need to worry about uh, diversion of power that's not just USB. Well, but you still, somebody can plug anything else in there. Mm -hmm. So we're working with them just to make six USB ports. And so this is what we're looking at um, for doing a small tablet and small uh, content server deployments, how to power them. Can I ask a, a question? The, the, the presence of the cigarette lighter outlets, does the mere fact that you have them draw energy because you better create that 12 volts, or do you only draw energy if you plug something no, in? No, only if you plug something in. So just having them there is not a cost? No. No, it's just uh, that then anything can be plugged in there. Um, but this does come with a nice, you know, uh, LED light. Uh, and this is only takes like one one watt. So, but our main focus is to run, you know, to run something like the Rachel server and uh, a couple laptops or six tablets off of this. And so it becomes this nice little package for. Uh, a school to start with an ICT project that's self-powered. Can we have the link to the product again? <clears throat> um, 
I think it's Phoenix International. Let me see if I can punch that in. It's, uh, it's a San Francisco-based organization. F-E-N-I-X-I-N-T-L. Uh, it's, it's around two hundred thirty dollars for the yeah. including the solar panel yes. and the and the backup, yes. and the battery backup. And then there is an optional charger for um, if you do have grid power to charge it via grid power also. So there's a lot of options. They, they're distributing these right now, and I think we have distributed five or six thousand of these in East Africa so far. So they're field tested. Uh, so. And the and the charger will charge the batteries. The batteries are rechargeable. In here, yes. Yeah, they yes. don't have to be replaced. No. Okay. So it's a gel cell that has it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Alex and I we got this during their Kickstarter phase. Okay. Um, I forget how much it was. Two fifty. Yeah, no something like that in that range. And yeah, I got I got the same thing like a panel like that. Um, a slightly different light. The LED was more like a round socket bulb. Um, and in fact, we have this sitting in the living room. I stuck that to the window, and I just charge my phone with it every night. I plug in the USB thing and just plug in my phone at night, and the next morning it's that was solar powered phone. No, yeah. <laughs> but for things like the Rachel Pie, yeah. powers them very easily, or tablets. So that's very neat. As I said, we. Um, you know, we've been working with them on, you know, be able to charge up to six tablets or three oil PCs on oh, us. In fact, from what I recall, one of the guys who runs this project was also involved in the sort of the original yo-yo charger stuff for the XO. I didn't know that. Because I, I got a, a whole box of these green cables the right from them, and that was when they were no longer doing that project. Um, so I think it's the same guys, or at least some overlap there. They, they were charging power by running a yellow. Yeah, there was some kind of a thing where you would pull the string and it would, you know, yeah. this was in the early days, mm -hmm. it would charge the XO, but evidently the, the the power that it output was very low. By the time it would, it would get up right. and it would switch on, this would sort of go back down. And I'm sure Richard remembers those. Okay. Any other solar adventures? Well, most of all the other solar we put in, I mean, we've built, Invineo has built about 2,000 solar powered computer labs in sub Saharan Africa. And most of those have been um, designed specifically for the equipment that's going in. The largest deployment was 900 schools in Tanzania, but those were all 20, every school got 20 Intel classmates. And so the solar system was designed to run those and a content server in the school. So that was, you know, and then they just cookie-cuttered that same design across 900 schools. Oh, wow. But like the, the 52 schools we've done in Haiti that are solar-powered, um, unfortunately, every one of those was a different design because it was designed for specifically for the equipment that went in those schools, and none of them were the same. So outside of the uh, classmate and I guess whatever, <coughs> XOs exist out there. Are you seeing any other equipment in that space, like on the client end of it? Well, I, I mean, right now the big trend in the market is tablets, mm -hmm. and we're seeing everything. I mean, for example, in Haiti, not, they now manufacture tablets in Haiti. I should say assemble them. Yeah. So any government-funded project uses the tablets that are produced. They're called SureTabs, and so they use those tablets specifically for the projects in Haiti now. So we've got. Uh, two of them here that we've been testing, uh, as well as how do we solar power those, and, and, how, and how, what is the charge rates, um, etc. Um, so, uh, but it seems everywhere we show up now, everybody wants to do tablets. I mean, I, I imagine the the requirements for charging tablets would be a lot different than what it was for laptops, yes. right? Because the power use is just so much is less. The big problem with tablets is that you can't charge them off a standard USB because the, they draw more power. Oh, okay. So you actually have to break the USB standards for charging. 
And that's what we've been working with Phoenix on is make sure these outputs have, can output enough amperage to charge those kind of devices. Okay. Yeah, I remember they had something, and I'll have to go back and check my email because they've sent an update one saying one of these two in the original box would allow you to charge an iPhone because the iPhone would pull a lot more. Exactly, because it didn't follow the USB right. standard. Right. And then while the other one would just limit up to the 500 milliamps. Or exactly. Was. Yeah. Hey, hey, Bruce. Yes. Uh, when, when you say the USB standard, are you talking about what's on the ready set right now? No, I'm talking about the, the, the standards put out by the industry organization. Right. So USB charging is 7.5 watts. But I, I guess I don't understand what you, when you said it, that the tablets don't break the USB standard. No, they do. They Some of them draw more power than that. Oh, just some specific ones. Okay, well, none of the ones that I've, you're, the, which, which, ta which ones in which particular? Uh, well, I don't, I would have to go. This one, it's very difficult to get to charge this from. Its own charger. Yes. Yeah. That's a Samsung Galaxy Tab. A Galaxy Tab. A lot so of them two amps at five volts, yeah. so that's over that. Volts, right? Which is seven and a half amps. Exactly. And then what is the high, higher power that you're? Uh, what one? Um, one amp. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I'm gonna have to look at that. Yeah, I guess the original USB had that limitation, right? But right. I haven't kept up with it, so. Well, that's just something you have to keep in mind if you're going to be charging other devices that are charged off the of USB. Do they exceed the standard? And if the, the charging, as you said, this one had one that meets the standard and one that doesn't. And some devices require that standard. If you put plug them into something that outputs more, you can damage them. So you have to be careful. Hey, Richard, I was curious about something. Um, so, you know, like the amount of work you guys put into the XO to have the charge controller and sort of manage uh, a fair bit of, uh, I guess, sketchy power coming in, um, how does that compare to what the tablets do now in terms of what's in the market? I mean, uh, is it similar? Is it different? Um, that was something I was curious uh, I would expect that most of them do not handle power variations good, uh, very good at all because they're all going to be sort of expecting that they're behind a USB charging port, which is going to handle all the, the the stuff. So I I wouldn't I wouldn't think like for instance early um, I don't know about the second generation of Nexus. I actually have one of those. I should check it. But the first generation of next of USB Nexus. It, the charging port was sensitive enough that if you just had a long USB cable, it wouldn't it it messed it up. I, I mean, it was a design fall, obviously, but it wouldn't it wouldn't charge fast. It would charge very slow. So, um, with the trend of those things being cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, I don't know, um, but because they're sort of expected that they've got a something already generating a solid five volts. Okay, so the cleanup is happening on the power end as opposed to the device end. Hmm. All right, well, since I've got the little floor here for a second, I need to actually say, I uh, unfortunately, I have a birthday thing that I have to go to, so I have to <laughs> run off. Um, okay. But it was nice uh, um, listening to you guys. I wish I could stay uh, longer. Maybe uh, for the next one, I'll be able to hang out a little longer. All right, cool. Well, thanks for joining. All right. See you, everybody. Take care. Bruce, you said that you're, you've got some uh, installation sort of set of the reservoir. Are you using the nook? Right. Well, because it needed more power. And, and so the nook, the, the nook uh, is the Barnes & Noble nook. Right? No, 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 no. NUC. Intel. NUC. Oh, no. it's, oh. A, it's a small computer. Well, the Nook is a, trans, uh, a tablet. That's what he was talking No, I'm about. referring to the Intel Nook, which is spelled N-U-C. N-U-C. Yes. Quote pronouncement. Yes. Yeah, okay. Good. Any other fun stuff? Uh, that's it for today. Okay. So, so I, I got onto your uh, uh, Rachel right. uh, server. 
and I got the math video, but it doesn't play. Is there something that I need to do that's special or? Yeah, that's probably something on the Excel side. Because oh. the XO, especially XO1, it can support uh -huh. so many kinds of things. So like, for instance, the videos we we mm -hmm. uh, used in India mm -hmm. um, from TED, mm -hmm. uh, we had to transcode all of those down <clears throat> to a certain level and uh, AUG video format so that they would play on the XO1. Oh, really? So, um, so yeah, the browser you have doesn't support that the video standard? In the XO1. Yeah, in the XO1, this, the image. This was updated. To 12, yeah, but 12 one is, is, is from a while ago. Okay. So, and even if you update it to the latest one, I'm not sure it'll play. Because uh -huh. uh, it depends on the video format that's on the server. It's on the server, it's not support. on the, the um, XL. Right. No. Would you like to try to see? Oh, no. I, you, I, you've I, already played this. You've already done this. Yeah, I know. It's not all. It, it's just like if you went to the can can economy videos on the internet, you wouldn't be able to see them either, because mm -hmm. it's the same format. Right. Right. I see. Okay. So I can't on here on the on the EXO with a, uh, a uh, an update from 2013, October of 2013 was when they updated this to 12.1.0. So I'm not going to be able to, to do this. Yeah. And it may very well be that the videos on the server need to be changed uh, so that they would run on the XO. Uh, so it may even be like my XO form and I'll be able to play right now. So What about on my tablet? That will probably play. I, I don't know what uh, codec those videos use, but there, it is possible to add codecs to the 12.1 uh, release. We do that for uh, what uh, Adam calls Haiti OS. Uh, oh, right, okay. And then yeah, I wanted to see what would code picks up some of the MPEG. I don't know about, you know, I don't know if this is Flash or MPEG or what it is. Um, yeah, I'm looking right now. But yeah, I suspect that's what it is. It's Mark that. We convert, con, um, converted the um, Khan Academy. The Khan uh, yeah, and we have a copy of that if anyone wants to. Right. Yeah, so I think that's what it is. It's just a matter of, but it, it should work on your tablet. Wikipedia for schools. There we go. Again, I have the the browser on the tablet. Yeah, but you're connected to the Raspberry Pi, and your your device is trying to get to the internet. Yeah, so I see um, I mean the player shows a spinning wheel. I don't know if you can see it there. There. So there's some kind of an embedded player. Let me see what what it has. She needs to connect to RPI is the SSID. Right, just just what you did before. Yeah, but how do you do that? Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. Well, we can take a look at the videos on, <coughs> excuse me, on, on the, the SD card and we know what, what the format is. What I suspect it, it'll work on the tablet, um, but I'm not sure if it'll work on the Excel. Okay. Anything else? Nope, that's the all. Solar? Okay. Yep. Um, should we move on to the Excel Viz? Well, I, I think we should say oh, yeah. it's, very, it's, yeah, it's okay. great. That's super. That's just I'm pretty thrilled to see this unit because it's, it's sitting in my living room. Like, yes. you know, it's, it's a real thing. Yeah, you got one of the early production units. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you know if there's anything updatable in that? Like firmware or something? Or? I, don't, I think an early one. And this one, no. But the next version, yes. They're actually oh, okay. going with uh, LCD display on this. Oh, on the, on the front. Yeah. Okay. And they're gonna have a little more intelligence in it. Okay, so uh, I just turned this this way. What I'm gonna do is do a screen share, and then I've got some slides to share with you. Let's see, screen share, screen share. There we go. So to window to show on the video call. Oh. Okay. So let's do this. So let's do this. 
Oh, you do? Okay, so you don't. Harry? Does anybody know how to uh, tell this thing which uh, access point to use? So the, the, the ratio is still there. It's still available if we can, we can get into it. Yeah, okay. I can get into it in some just a moment. There it is, okay. Okay, now. Okay, screen share. Let's see. This one, I guess. You find the note? Watch it. No, this one. It certainly plays on if I'm running Chrome. Yeah. Alright, can you guys see my screen? Well, it's writing. Has got to the part where he's actually yeah. drawing that. <laughs> that was the first thing that I realized. <laughs> Yes, yes, okay. Okay. All right, so this is uh, XOVIZ. Um, I put a few slides together to just sort of do an overview of what this project is and where we are. And we have a, a running server today. So I've got a XO 1.75 that's been reflashed to work as a server. And it's running the XOCE 5.0 server with the XOVIZ thing added to it. So let me sort of walk you through what this stuff is. Um, a lot of this is to, to do with looking into the data that's coming from the laptops uh, uh, and then trying to make some sense of it. Um, so learning analytics is a field. Uh, they, they sort of look at four different stages. Uh, you've got um, the measurement phase, which is you're measuring the activity, whatever happens on the computer. Uh, so that happens within the sugar activity itself. Um, and you have to figure out how to measure that, whether you want to keep track of the mouse and the cursor and so on, or you want to just look at proxies like, you know, the length of time that the act application was running for and the activity within it, was it shared, was it not shared, um, time of day, so on. There's a collection part where somewhere this data has to be collected, and within the XO, it's collected inside the journal, well, actually within each activity which is, then lives in the journal. Then there is the analysis and reporting part, which is make some sense of it and make it available. So the visualization part is uh, more on the reporting side, um, and that tends to get more visibility because, well, it's visual. But, uh, you know, proper reporting means, well, you, you have the graphs and the charts, but also sort of the whole idea of what you're analyzing and the meaning behind it. And, um, uh, for me spe specifically, uh, the one concern I have is um, when you have a lot of analysis that's driven purely by data, then you could possibly see things that don't exist. So you know, you you may see correlation, and you may jump and say, "Oh, that will also imply causality." And so, um, XOVIZ is an add-on, and it was built as an add-on so that you have an existing server like the. XS 0.7, which came from all PC, or the XS CE, which is the community edition, and you would essentially add this onto it. So even if you went off into the field and let's say you have a XS 0.6 from back in the day, you should be able to add this on and do the visualization part. Uh, but that's kind of where this uh, this is coming from. So, um, in fact, when we were doing the design of this, one of the things I had in the back of my mind was what Carol had suggested a while ago was there were these schools in Afghanistan that have the XOs, wouldn't it be neat to go back and kind of see what they've been up to? Right? So I'm speaking to the past, maybe three years ago. And my guess is that most of those XOs still have their journals intact because they haven't been reflashed or anything. And we would be able to go and pull that out and look at what actually happened maybe three years ago, four years ago, whenever you know these would be used, or if they're still being used. So that's the other thing I had in mind was we should be able to go to projects and do that. Um, um, in history, yeah. Yeah. 
and then while you were there, you had access to the uh, 50 years so, uh -huh. so you were in a room in Afghanistan, the 50 years so, that would be good. Well, of course, I will probably send Carol because she has better chances of coming back alive than I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the, the, the process would be that you would probably take a small device, say, such as the dream plug or something like that, um, which would be portable enough, or even maybe the XO uh, acting as a server, turn that on as a server, go into that, and get all those XOs to register to that server as, you know, yeah, over, over Wi-Fi. So you go to the, the XO icon and say register. The server, right. When they sign, you know, connect to the server in a matter of, I would, my guess would be about hours. Those XOs will push their data to the server, and there we go. Mm -hmm. You need that step, and then you got to bring that back with you. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's uh, you know, you you drop in for a day. You watch out for ISIS. Get shot. Right. And you fix all the XOs and bring the back device back. So yeah, I think operationally it's it's uh, one of those things where if it's streamlined, you could in fact take this take that down and bring it back and have the data. Uh, historically, the way this has happened, uh, Paraguay had uh, a project where they did some of this stuff. They wrote something, uh, I think they were, it was pretty specific for what the group wanted to do. So they wrote some software, um, I think it was a combination of Python and Ruby and so on, to do something similar, look into the journal and pull the data out. Um, but it was not, it was there, but it had missing pieces and we were not able to make it work. In Jamaica, I worked with Lotus, who was on the call. Um, and he was able to write uh, a piece of uh, basically a script that is able to pull this data out. And that was step one. And then we did step two, which is uh, to be able to view this in some kind of an aggregate form. Uh, Anish has been working in India using a slightly different uh, system of collection of data. But again, the, the concept is similar. So he was, in fact, uh, at the project about two weeks ago. And set up a new server with the updated software. Um, our connectivity unit burned out using a uh, device, a cell phone connection, and that burned out. So we'll be replacing that in, the, in a couple of weeks, and then it should come back alive, and then. And then uh, Martin, who actually wrote a bunch of the stuff, uh, is working in the hall. Uh, back now. Um, and he wrote a whole bunch of the stuff that I'm going to show you today. Uh, he's in the Czech Republic. And then there are other projects which are related, but uh, we haven't really done much. So there is a blog post there, uh, and I'll post these slides up on the site as well. So you can look at some detail of this history. Uh, in terms of the methodology, uh, uh, I've got a couple of research papers in the publication pipeline, as we call it, uh, which can take years to revise and resubmit and review and whatever. So maybe this year it will get published. But one of the papers, the methodologies has been, we start with a qualitative piece, which is um, look at in-class observation, do interviews, uh, you know, mostly semi-structured interviews with parents and family and so on. Um, in fact, we've got one, you can see a little clip there, uh, or screenshot. That should be up in a few days, uh, done with some children there. Uh, so we started that, which is talk to people and say, you tell us what's going on, as opposed to saying, let's look at the data and figure out what's going on. Uh, and I think it's important as a methodology to start with the people first, not the data first. Uh, you start with the people to see what they say. Then you go to the data kind of see whether the data actually supports what they're saying. So the children say, oh, we love to read books. Uh, and we read books every day, right? Then you go into the data and see, does the data actually support that, right? And if it doesn't, then it doesn't. And there may be a reason why they're telling us that they like to read books. But they don't. Um, or maybe the data actually says that, yes, they do like to read books. Like in Jamaica, you know, they, they would come and tell us they love Huxmas. Um, Hound us for X math. 
and the data actually supported that. That's what's mapped is the most popular activity. That's good. So that methodology is there. The qualitative is supported by the data, the quantitative. So that's, uh, we've got a couple of papers in the pipeline for that. Um, a lot of this is about metadata, but metadata has gotten a bad um, name these days because of these three letter government agencies. Um, so it's not really a bad word, though, uh, because it is, it is data about data. So for instance, we would not look at the creative work of a child. We would look at the data about the creative work. So instead of looking at a painting, I would look at things like, was it created? How long did it take to create it? Was it shared with somebody? Uh, did they go back and redo the work? How many times did they do that? And then that becomes a proxy for what it is that they're trying to measure, which is the you know, level of engagement or learning and whatever that may be. Uh, in most cases, we're not looking at a particular kid. We're looking at an aggregate across uh, classroom, school, uh, project. Um, you could drill down to a specific child, but you know, it depends on what you're looking for. Uh, so the data storage sugar is uh, written in Python, which is what stores all the work done by children. And the front end to that is the journal. And the journal is really we have all the stuff like searching, indexing, retrieval, and so on. Um, and what we are doing is extracting the metadata from the journal. Right? So the journal backup is really where we pull the stuff from. And again, like I said, metadata is about data. So for instance, uh, what you see here is these are some of the fields that will get stored. Uh, is an index, the activity itself, the color of the icon, uh, uh, the creation time, uh, share scope, whether it was shared or not uh, with anybody, uh, if they choose a particular title, uh, timestamp, and a bunch of other things. Then we're able to extract that into a spreadsheet and then do things with it. So that's sort of what we've been thus far. Uh, ExoViz um, is a little cloud element, if you will, which is different ways of sort of looking at the same data but in a visual form. The idea is what happens at the school, can we sit somewhere centrally and watch it? Um, so the architecture is, you've got the laptop, which has an offline content, it goes to the school, it goes home, and it has a journal on it. Then you've got the school, where you have a sort of a microcloud. The microcloud basically is the server. In this case, the machines are here. Uh, you, you could have multiple Wi-Fi units plugged into one server, uh, but it will also act as a uh, out of the room at the school. And it may be offline, it may be online, but let's say the school gets disconnected from the outside, the laptop still have access to all the stuff on the server. You connect the server to the outside, so you have access to the internet and other central resources. So the bigger cloud that you see there is perhaps something being done at the ministry uh, or a central location where you're gathering data from all the different schools. Right? So the hierarchy is the laptop, the school, and then say the ministry of education. So all the work done by the kids is stored on the journal. It's automatically done. Uh, we gather those things at the school and then at the school. So the idea is that at the school, the teacher and the principal should be able to view the aggregates per classroom or per school, whether they're connected to the ministry or not. So the principal should be able to, you know, this was interesting. At one of the schools, they said, the principal said, I'm not so interested in what to do with the laptops. Uh, I'm more interested in do the laptops actually show up at school every day. If we gave out 30, do all 30 come to school every day? So for the principal, it was more of a resource question. And so surely the school server, you know, will see the laptops every day. And so we can look by day of the week and figure out 20 showed up, 25 showed up, 30 showed up. Whereas the teacher is interested in what they're doing in the classroom, at home, there. Um, so this happens at the school. And that happens on the episode, uh, on, on the school server. Uh, if you look at this, this is this is they've got three different schools. The micro cloud bubble is the three schools have their own school servers, and then you've got the large cloud, which is the So over time, 
what we want is that we want the data from the school to get synchronized with the ministry. That can happen once a week, once a day. Depends on your connectivity. Okay. Um, then the big issue is, this is something we see in all the projects, most of the projects, is that the connection will break at some point. And so you have to have some technology in the middle that's robust enough to pick up where it left off. Uh, and make sure that the data actually gets to the other end and it's consistent and robust, all those things. So what we did was we looked at uh, some kind of a database that's at each school, which works for that school, and then a database. Uh, that little you know, cylindrical thing is a database. Um, and then there would be some mechanism to synchronize the school's database with the ministry's database, and that should be robust enough. And so we're using something called Couch. This was another thing that we added to the mix. Um, CouchDB is a database where it does offline synchronization. So, you know, the connection comes on, goes off, comes on, goes off. It will make sure that the synchronization happens, even if it takes six months. Um, it also does things like it will actually store the entire application, the JavaScript and all of those things within the database. So it's very easy to actually move things from one school to the other. So for a variety of reasons, we found that this would be a good fit. And so, you know, the database that you saw is really high speed in this case. And then from the school to the ministry, there is some kind of a one way application. In fact, that arrow should be one way arrow. I'll change it. Schools to ministry is a replication. So uh, to give you an example, let's say there is a school and the children bring the laptops five days a week. So each laptop will have data exactly when the child works on it. Then the school server will have data perhaps once every day or two days. The happens to the XO to the school server. And the school server to the ministry, depending on their connection, it may happen every day. It may happen once a week. Um, so the India project, we actually turn the server on, or rather we connect it to the internet once a day at 4 p.m. and then we disconnect at 10 p.m. Right? So in that duration, that would be the window when the synchronization will happen. Um, and CouchDB is great because Couch sort of manages all this stuff without having to write extra software for it. So there's no extra code to do all this together. Couch just takes care of synchronizing everything from one end to the other. Um, the ExoVis project itself, uh, I've just put a few short notes here. Uh, mostly for people in the world, um, for reference. So the software is up on GitHub. Uh, you go download it from there. You run the installation script. If you're using the school server, uh, the XSCE uses something called Ansible. And a lot of it is written by Tim and other guys who are on the call. And uh, Ansible then sort of manages the installation and configuration of us. So on the school server, that's what I did. I just followed the directions for Ansible and installed it. And once you install it, uh, it's still run by hand. These are the scripts you have to run. Uh, these can be automated, of course. And so what it does is, um, if you look at all the backup that's on the school server from the different XOs, and periodically grab that and push it into the CouchDB, so that the CouchDB database has the data from all the laptops. And then, when you go and say, hey, show me the graph, it's coming from that database. So this is for well, I'm an information systems person, so I have to have a <laughs> a flowchart of sorts. Export it as JSON, which is JavaScript documentation, which then goes into the CouchDB and then does all the virtualization. Um, my apologies for it. Don't follow this talk. <laughs> uh, it's actually been a while since I did a little bit of these things, so it was fun. Um, all right, so this is what you actually get to see. So on the XO, you go and sort of type the URL, and what I'm seeing here is, I forget this was for maybe two laptops or something like that, and it's kind of hard to read here, but uh, it gives me a chart that says launched instances for web, and it says seven, so that means the browse activity was used seven times on this laptop, right? 
uh, whereas the exoscope and word at the one at the bottom, they were just used once. So it's giving you some kind of a distribution of saying what was used how. Um, oh, by the way, guys, uh, I can't see your chat window here, so if you're posting stuff there, I wouldn't be able to see it. Um, oh, Samir? Yeah. I'm not seeing your presentation. You're not? Is anybody else seeing it? I'm only seeing it before you started into the actual slide presentation. So we see the we see PowerPoint, but we don't see. Yes. Uh, wow. Okay. It's probably another screen. Yeah. That's not fun. Anyway, we're listening. Oh wait. Yes. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can. Oh. <clears throat> No, they're here, but they're not able to see. Can you see it now? What, what slide number are you on? <laughs> um, well, I don't know. But I, do you see I, a chart? Well, I can see 18. I know you, you can continue from where you're at. Okay. All right. So, and then if you don't see it moving, just pick up. So this is one of the ones. Uh, this is the activity frequency. And this one shows you um, the files generated, how many files were generated. So the difference is one shows how many times the application was used or the activity. The other says what was the output of it. Did you create something, save it, uh, use that distribution. Uh, this is showing um, sharing. So did somebody actually share that with another person? So uh, and you know a lot of these. So for a lot of these things, we have to go back and retweak the the kind of. Uh, charts we're using. So for instance, for some of these things, it would probably be better representation of a pie as opposed to a, a line graph. So, But those are e easily changeable, so that's something we still have to do. Um, this says time of day. So this goes across, it says 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 24. So it tells you, uh, you know, what time of day the activity is being used. Um, so this is interesting because this shows us, uh, so for instance, if you knew that the school finishes at 3 p.m., you could set it up where it would tell you what happens post 3 p.m. and pre 3 p.m., and that would give you a proxy for in school and out of school. So we did that for Jamaica, and we found the split to be something like 35% in school and 65% out of school. Right? And I'm sure there'll be some on the edge, but that gives you an approximation which also tells you that it's important for the laptop to go home because they're doing a lot of things at home. If it's kept in school, you would only be looking at the 35%. Um, like, well, I don't know, does Nepal keep them at home or send them? When I was there, they were not allowed. Oh, they're not, them. okay. I think even Australia doesn't send them home. Um, they keep them at school. Um, this is um, activity used by month. So January, February through December, uh, this goes up to September because that's all they used. Um, and so this is giving you usage by month. And so you may perhaps see reflection like what happens over the summer. If you say, hey, summer vacation, they're not going to do anything with it. But instead, you see that the usage has gone up over the summer. That means that they are, in fact, using it over the summer. Um, this is by year. So this one, I. I from what I recall, I think this is data from just one XO. I just wanted to pull the charts to see what they look like. So you can see 2013 and 14. Uh, the usage is different. Only 15, 14, 15 activities in 2013, and 40 plus activities in 2014. So it gives you uh, a year thing. Uh, and these are a little more complicated. Uh, this is supposed to give you the launched instances, so what was inst uh, launched by year, but there's a lot of uh, overlap. So you just see like three lines or four lines there, but it's basically 25 lines which are one on top of the other. So that's why you don't see much here. Uh, you can toggle this by turning off all the different activities, and then, but it still doesn't give you, you know, the actual richness of use. So we have to rethink this. And the same thing here. Uh, it doesn't actually give you much. Now, this works in a browser, so what you were seeing was in the XO, but this is on my laptop, and you know it'll basically work in any browser. 
So the idea here is that if the principal has a desktop and not an XO, they should still be able to view this. At the ministry, again, they should be able to view this. And you know, we still haven't sort of built a login system on top of this, but arguably, you know, your favorite minister of education should be should be able to pull out his phone and then you know fiddle with it and say, here, look, this is what's happening uh, in in these schools in my country and so on. Um, so the idea was to keep it all browser-based uh, so that it actually is accessible throughout. Um, the things that I haven't done but Martin has is you can add multiple schools to this. So I'm I'm sort of doing a you know single hypothetical school with one XO just to look at the data. But what Martin has is he's got something like five schools in Nepal. They are all in one system. So you can pick a school and say, show me the data at the school. Or you can say, let me pick a school and now compare this with another school. So I can compare activity from between two schools uh, or multiple schools. And that's very useful. Um, there were a couple of things. One motivation was to just keep an eye on the difference in usage. But the other was um, evidently there was some uh, sentiment of, you know, we want to do better than the other school. So if we compare, then we know where we are short and then we'll you know, ramp it up. I don't know if that's a good thing, but <laughs> that came up in one of the conversations. So that's something he's done. I haven't done that as yet. Uh, but it would be, now, you know, we are classifying this in a hierarchy just sort of based on how we do this, which is a school, a district, a country, and so on. But there's nothing stopping you, if you have access to this data, to say, let me compare something in Nepal with something in Jamaica, right? You just pick two schools, and you should be able to compare as long as you have access to that data. Um, and the development is continuing. My guess is this is probably sitting at 85% done. Another 15% is tweaking of the graphs and some export stuff. And then uh, the code is still very um, Nepal-centric because he wrote it for Nepal. So he still has to clean out a little bit of those things so that you know it doesn't say oily Nepal everywhere. And, you can have some branding of your own in there and those kinds of things. So, so that's kind of where it is, um, the XOVIS system. Um, let me see if I can share on the screen the actual server. Okay. Um, oh, Bruce, we got you on the call too. Yeah, Mark's looking at you. Oh, okay, all right. If your slides are, if your slides are showing. Are they showing now? Yeah. Okay. So let me see if I can do another screen share. Of, uh, now I see you. Fantastic. Um, okay, so. Okay, so this is the school server. And you still see me? I only see you. Okay, so let's do a screen share again. And... Da, da, da. There. All right. Now what do you see? Okay. So, any can you guys see the welcome to the school server? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, all right. So this is what's running on the school server. This is talk. I haven't done any changes to it. Uh, it's all English. Uh, this Pathagar Internet in a Box Moodle. Um, it is in English. It's in Spanish, which looks like English because uh, it hasn't been changed. And then it says Hindi and uh, this the few words here and there. So in fact for the India project Anish has you know put in time and converted everything into Hindi but it just there are just a few words that have been translated. But the point here is that you can actually localize this in the language you want. Uh, so for instance it says Swagatam where it says welcome. That's one Hindi word. Moodle is in Hindi and the rest of the stuff is all English. So let me switch back to English. How do you know how to say Moodle? You just say Moodle. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Pathagar, I went ahead and uploaded a bunch of books to kind of see if it would work, and it does. Now this is uh, XO 1.75 with 512 megs of RAM. So this is just sort of right there. Uh, in fact, if I push it a lot, it just fails. So it needs more more than 512 megs of RAM. It consumes something like 410 right now when it's sitting doing nothing. 
So that's Pathagar. I just uploaded a bunch of books there, uh, and sure enough, it does work. Um, the search part, let's try that out. Tune. You can see it takes a, takes a bit of time to, but there it is. It searches by title. So there, that's by title. And then that's by author. This is the most downloaded. And so there's 78 books on this thing. Uh, what book is the most downloaded? Oh. Okay. It's just there. I mean, it's not, it hasn't been used, so. Oh, I see. Um, that's a category. It's the just category a category, right. What are the most downloaded? Right. Books? So if you were using this in the field, you would be able to see the most popular downloads. Um, now, there's no um, quick way to go back to the opening page other than just sort of removing everything from the URL, going back there. Um, and then there are some other things that work here. In fact, I got sidetracked. So let me pull up the ExoViz stuff that's on here. So that's running live. You see it says only Nepal. Uh, that needs to be changed. So I have a hypothetical school. And I click on there, and there's the data. So that's coming from there. Um, and I can actually add other journal backups by hand, and it'll actually reflect here and give me something new. Uh, and these are aggregates. So this is only for one machine, but if you had five five exos worth of backup, it'll give you an aggregate uh, as opposed to a single uh, exo. So there, time of day. Um, I guess I can scroll this down a little bit so you can see the whole thing. Um, so actually, um, give me a few seconds. I have uh, some more data here. Maybe I can do this, add some data to. For, well, we can, I have a comment. Yes, yes. For non OLPC installations, uh -huh. there is a free cloud tool that does all of this called Meraki Device Manager. Oh, right, right, right. So we use that and Invideo for the exact same thing that you're doing here. Okay. So, for example, the 2000 tablets we just uh, distributed to schools and did all the teacher training in, in Kenya, uh -huh. we look at, okay, we don't look, in this case, we don't look down to what the students are doing. We actually look at what the teachers are doing. And oh, okay. there's a few teachers that are really good at technology. They've really integrated the tablets into the classroom. So what applications are they using? What content are they using? And then we use that information to train the other teachers that haven't quite integrated and grasped the technology yet into their classroom. So we're using it to improve the teacher experience. Oh, interesting. Um, and then uh, what does it collect? Or, or what is it? It collects um, what applications are being added to the tablets, uh, how often those applications are being accessed, what content's been oh, added, okay. how often is that being. It tracks the location of it. Okay. In fact, it's interesting because one of the demos we show people how we use it, we deploy, we did a small project in the Philippines with 25 tablets for, for, her, for uh, typhoon um, disaster management. Okay. And now when we look at the world map of where those tablets are, there's two in Dubai, there's one in New York City, there's oh. two in uh, Romania. So somehow what was supposed to be in the Philippines, those tablets have gone. <laughs> and it's interesting because whoever has those tablets doesn't realize we're watching this. Oh. <laughs> and we can see what applications, what websites they're going to. Um, then I hate to say what those guys in Dubai are looking at yeah. on those tablets. Yeah. Yeah. Do they have cameras in there? Can you take a picture of the person? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who's, who's watching the watchers? Exactly. Right. But um, the goal of is similar to what this is, is really look yeah. at how they're using them in the classroom and how do we improve that yeah. for other classrooms. So when you say this is cloud-based, um, so this is running somewhere centrally. So it's running an agent on the tablet. Oh, and then it pushes And then the when data. it gets connected okay. to the internet, it yeah. pushes the data. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. That's, that's pretty similar to this. So I just added one more exos worth of data to the backup thing there and ran the the script. So let's see if, if it does anything here. Um, and the first time you run it, it takes a little bit of time. There you go. See the green that wasn't there. 
That's now an aggregate of two XOs worth, um, as opposed to just one. And so this will, of course, keep on changing uh, as you add more and more data. Um, something that occurred to me was that, you know, this is at that instance in time. So there also needs to be a way to sort of capture the history, which is have something which automates um, perhaps dumping this every night into a into a format where then you, you have this historical perspective of looking at data, you know, um, backwards in a sense. Um, and so this should now reflect um, that looks pretty similar. That will probably look similar as well, slightly different usage by year. That's 2014, 2013. That's changed a little bit. So as you add more and more journal backups. And HDB version the JSON Yeah. So then you have um, Yeah, I guess you could go back and look at that, right? Um, so, um, and you're still able to see my screen, right? Yeah. So, just to show you what the Couch DB thing looks like. Um, so, Couch DB has this application called Futon, which is um, a browser based management thing. Exobase is the database that we're looking at. It's 2.2 megs here. Um, each one of these things is essentially the data coming from um, an Exo. So for instance, this is coming from memorized activity and uh, is share scope is private um, and it's got launch times and so on. So this is the data that is being stored in CouchDB. Um, However, Couch has this thing called design documents. So if you sort by design documents, the actual application, which is HTML and JavaScript and all of that stuff, is also stored in the database. And so if you go there, you'll see all the, these are all the JavaScript files. The, Martin's using high charts. You remember high charts? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and in here is a, an index.html file somewhere down here, there, the index.html file, which if I click on, well, guess what? It'll take me here. So the entire application and the data from the projects is all stored in one database. So it's very easy to move the whole thing from one place to the other. So in fact, if you have a school that doesn't have any connect connection at all, forget intermittent, it just does not have connectivity, you can still take a USB stick, synchronize the database from the server onto the stick, and then get on your motorcycle and drive back to Kathmandu and, you know, refresh your, your central database. Um, and Couch will allow you to do that. So Couch is pretty, pretty interesting um, as, as a platform for this. So whether it's Kathmandu or Kabul yeah. or Kingston. There you go. <laughs> I got all the three cases. You got all the three cases. Uh, you'd be able to. So, you know, I was showing you, this is the live ones. I was showing you how these lines overlap. So I can turn these off, like Abacus, and nothing happens there. But let's see, this was, so this is an overlap of Calculate, Implode, Physics, and Web. Four, you know, right on top of the other. So if I turn off, say, Web, uh, Calculate, Abacus, and then what was the other one? Uh, well, this is a lot of lines. Um, let's pick something simpler. Actually, I'll just turn these off one by one. You'll, you'll actually see it. So these lines will start to disappear because a lot of these are just one on top of the area. So that was the measure activity. And you'll see how it adjusts the scale based on what the data is. Um, and if I turn off all of these, So then after you turn them all off, you can turn on one at a time. Right, right. And maybe there should be a toggle to do this and just toggle, turn everything off and then, so everything is gone and now if you want to see music keyboard, one instance February 14 through June, um, info slicer, one instance, um, let's measure there. 
So, yeah, this is not a good way to plot this. So this is something we have to change for sure. Okay, so that I think is all I have. So let me turn off screen share. Okay. All right. Oh yeah, heading up. Okay. Oh, you guys have any questions about any of this stuff? Turn back. So Samir. Yes. What's the next steps with the project with the XOBIS project? So the next steps, um, one is, you know, revisit the charting because it's definitely not uh, the best it could be. Um, <clears throat> so that's one. The second is, um, you know, we have a fair number of servers that use the original XS as opposed to XC. So I have to test and make sure this can be added on top of that. So for instance, the servers in Jamaica, they're all running XS. And I'd like to add this to that. So test some of that and make sure that it all works. And then um, I think a couple more sort of administrative uh, cleanup things that need to happen in the code. Um, and then, of course, some documentation. There is documentation on GitHub, but it's not enough. It's really not. OK. Documentation for the teachers or for the tech well, persons? All the installation, um, you know, maintenance and use. Okay. So, server server side documentation and then of course, all the teachers and principal and whoever. Okay. And maybe we can talk to OPC Canada again and see if they want to. Just up again. Oh, I can do that. Yeah. Well, PC Canada to test the Canada uh, yeah. one. Yeah, they had initially, you know, Jennifer had initially showed interest, and that's kind of where Leotis was working because he, he's moved to Canada, so we were working on this there. Uh, so to revisit because she wanted to do this at, I think, like one or two schools locally. And then her thing was the two things that she wants. One is a lot of the schools they run are very remote. So this would be a good <laughs> happening. Um, the second is when you go to get additional funding, your funding agencies want to know what has been already happening and where you are. To show this would be a way to show that. So that's kind of our interest. Maybe we can that. And like I said, I mean, this is something where with a little more effort, this could be built into a unit that can be taken anywhere. Mm -hmm. to extract this yeah, if uh, what would be the justification for trying to write a grant to go back to Afghanistan to do this? Well, this is a project that's that has been deployed and there's no follow-up in terms of understanding how it has worked, mm -hmm. if it has worked, and you know, where it failed, if it has. Um, and so Way to go back and see, and then sort of learn from that to continue with the mission. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. I mean, I don't even know if, if any follow up happened in Afghanistan since. Well, uh, none, that, the, none that I'm aware of, and none that the. Computers were given out, and that was it. Yeah. There was no. A community grant program. This could be something they would. Because what they want to look. Technology. Well, now, now we. to get in and get out who uh, might be interested in this. Maybe we can put together are interested in working with OPC stuff. We're just very you know, interested. They just don't know what to work on. This might be one of those things. Mm -hmm. 
academic students? Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that would be great. So. Oh, and then um, I forgot to, since I guess we have a live system running here. Let's see. Um, oh, and so by the way, this whole Hangout is running through the school server. So it's actually holding up. Um, it's pretty neat. Um, let's see. I was going to... Well, we have good bandwidth into the building, too. Yeah, so that helps. Yeah, like 100, like 100 megabit per second connection. Good webcast. I don't know if that is. Who's your provider? Monkey brains? Oh, yeah. Those guys are good. Okay, so I'm going to do a screen share of uh, another service running on here called Munin on the school server. And uh, are you able to see that? Yes. Okay. And so Munin uh, keeps uh, track of what's happening on the server with respect to the disk use and network and so on. So this is another neat service. You can go and sort of look at how the disk input output has been used, uh, the network itself. Uh, all those peaks are essentially bursts of traffic. Uh, so my guess is, you know, the you see a little gap over here. That's when the server was turned off, and I brought it here, so it was off. And then that peak after that is probably a bunch of our Hangout session going on. But these peaks that you see before, uh, this is when this thing was running at home, and I was running Netflix through it, you know, for testing, of course. So, you know, hook up my tablet and get out of Netflix, watch a movie, watch you know, a couple of shows, and so those peaks are a lot of that is. And so if you want to look at the detail, you can do, um, you can go in there, uh, look at the details. This is where the server has to sort of redo the the, the graph, so it takes a few seconds. Um, and there, so that's the detail. And then what you can do is you can actually do this to say zoom into this part, and it'll redo the graph and zoom in into that part. So it'll take another few seconds and. Uh, So is this recording the uh, what the the connection was to? It's right. recording that it was to Netflix. No, no, just recording how much data went out, how much data came in. Uh, I just know it's Netflix because I was sitting there watching. <laughs> so there you can see this is now zoomed in, and it tells you the connection, the stuff that comes in goes out. Um, Oh, so the green is going out and the, the green is coming uh, in. Green is, I think it says established connection. And then the the purple part of the blue part here is UDP, which is usually used for video. Um, so you can look at a lot of detail here. I'm going to go back. Um, uh, you can look at other detail here. Um, a number of processes. This is the CPU usage, mm -hmm. so you can see whether your CPU is being maxed out or not. Um, so it's, it's good to keep an eye on the health of the server itself. And it's got a few other services running on there. So I don't know, it's, it's, it's a lot of good stuff on there. Okay, so that's that's all I have on the ExoViz thing and the school server uh, update. Um, we do have internet in a box, which I got this um, a few days ago. This is a one terabyte hard drive, it has 760 gigs worth of data that I've now copied onto here. Uh, so I have a copy, and then I think we should keep another copy somewhere. So we have a couple of copies floating. Um, it has. Wikipedia in 37 languages and 40,000 books from Gutenberg and a whole bunch of other things. And then there's a project that uh, Tony Anderson and others have been working on called Bernie, which is a oh, Bernie. Bernie, named after our friend. Named after uh, yes, uh, which is a superset of this, which is it's Internet in a Box plus a few other things being used at different schools. Um, 
So, so that's something we have now. Uh, How many books did you say? Forty thousand. So I do have some. Um, it's Project Gutenberg. I believe most of them are English, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I did get. Um, what time is it? How are you guys on the call? Can I run through some Internet in a Box slides? Okay, Mike says sure. So do that. Uh, yeah, you have, okay. So Bernie's focus solely on XO. No, this is I guess you know it was Internet in a Box plus other projects that uh, were used, or rather OPC related projects that were using other content. So they sort of added that to this. And well, for this, but Bernie itself. I'm looking at the, the project Bernie.org. Oh, okay. It's all about setting it up with, on an Excel server for Excel laptops. Well, I don't think it's Excel specific. I don't know. Anybody on the call might know. Hey, any of you guys know about Bernie? Uh, if it is uh, all PC specific? Which project? Tim? The Bernie project. Project Bernie. Wilderness. Hmm? Tim, do you know if this is exo specific? Tim is still on. I just sent the chat with the web link. If you look yeah, at yeah. it, it says it's for supporting it, so it doesn't talk about any other platforms at all. That's Bernie's picture from the conference. No, my understanding is it is so not. If you, if you go down the overview, it's yeah. for how to Bernie, it only talks about Excel. Yeah. I mean, it's fine. I'm just it looks like that's what they focused on to have an Excel platform. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my understanding was it, it, it isn't, but I don't know. It, could it, be it grew out of Nepal. Uh, so it, it it was originally aimed at XOs. Obviously, the th content like Khan Academy or any of the uh, Internet in the Box stuff can be consumed by other clients. But it it you know it grew out of uh, of the Ole Nepal uh, XS uh, 7.0 uh, uh, server and the content that Tony had added to that in Nepal, and he's packaged it up in a way that. Basically, you can uh, you can generate the install that you want. So you can you get a, a graphical interface that allows you to pick which versions of Wikipedia and other things you want, and then it generates uh, a USB stick that'll do the install for those things. So so it is kind of aimed at XOs, but there are other clients can consume the data. Mm, okay. Um. I'm going to go quickly run through some of these slides I got from the guys from Internet in a Box. Um, are you able to see these? Yes. Okay. Um, just to sort of give you everybody an overview. So their mission is to make it available to the unconnected world. It's basically a hard drive, um, 70 to 250 bucks. Uh, so there it is. So 37 languages. Uh, for Wikipedia, uh, they have OpenStreetMaps, which are uh, pre-rendered, so they they're already stored in here for the entire world, down to the street level. So you'd be able to essentially run OpenStreetMaps without going online, uh, which is, is is a great resource. Uh, and then it's got this section of software, which which got a whole bunch of open source software and software repositories for Ubuntu and whatnot. So it can li literally run like an offline mirror for Ubuntu installations and such, and then the Khan Academy stuff. Um, the one thing that I have in the India project that I did not see here is the TED videos, and so that's something that I'd like to add on to that at some point. Do the, they have all the Khan Academy stuff? Well, it says 500 plus, so I, mm -hmm. I think they do. Um, 
and uh, this is all the reasoning behind it. I'll skip over this. Um, that's sort of the justification of, you know, online versus offline, why we need something like this. Um, uh, okay, so who's using it? And these are some of the target devices. Obviously, we've got all these Excels and um, tablets and such. So this is this is designed to be not all PC specific, although you will always run into that issue of videos not playing on the Excel. So you would have to convert those. Um, these are some of the boxes. So some of these units, they so for instance, the one on the upper right, uh, that hard drive has a built-in wireless thing. So the hotspot is built into the drive. You plug in the power and it's got its own Wi-Fi. You just connect to it and then be able to. So very similar to this. Right. So this has 32 gigs of data. It's, you know, it's this with the Wi-Fi on it that right. has, you know, a terabyte of data. Right. So it's just a lot more information you can pack on. Or you, you could take this and plug it into that, right? But quarters of it. Right. But that's a spinning drive. Right. Um, so it's, you know, different technology yeah. but, and a different cost. Right. And practically speaking, for instance, uh, you would probably not need Wikipedia in 37 languages for a particular deployment. You would may need maybe two or three. And so the rest you could delete. Um, and so your image size will come down. Um, but yeah, I mean, 32 gig versus 760 gig. Different approaches to the same right. issue. Similar issue, yeah. Um, and then these ones at the bottom, these are not Wi-Fi based. They're just, you know, Ethernet, so you plug it into an existing network, but you would still have the same thing, which is, you know, access to the material, but locally. So either the Rachel or the internet in the box, does the, do those have to be downloaded in some slow process, or can they be printed or flashed or whatever? I'm not sure what you mean by downloaded. Well, did, how long does it take to uh, put the, the data onto Rachel or put the data onto internet in the box? You mean make a copy of it? Yeah. So I got this from the Internet in the Box guy Braddock fiasco from LA. Mm -hmm. So this came in the mail. And then I did a copy from here to here, and that oh. took 21 hours. 21 hours. Yeah. And the uh, that was 21 hours on USB 2. Adam says he can do it in 4 to 5 on USB 3. Right. So, you know, I tried this thing um, yesterday with um, a USB 3 hub. But because I've got only one USB 3 port, uh, the hub is actually acting as both, you know, like in and out. And so I didn't see a major difference in the transfer time. But yeah, if you have two USB 3 ports on your computer, I'd imagine you could do this in about six hours. Well, I'll find out tonight because I'm about to run a copy from a, a USB <laughs> 3 drive to a, an internal drive. Uh, I'll see oh, okay, that yeah, that, that should be fast enough, yeah. So I want to I have it on an internal drive so that when I make copies, I'm always running from the internal drive. Right, that makes sense. So the Rachel would be transferred by using these uh, Oh, okay. I think the biggest difference between oh. this and Rachel is uh, I don't think Rachel has a full Wikipedia. I think they've curated articles aimed at school. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have yeah. the open street maps. Uh, right. Here you've got a bunch of Linux software that you may or not uh, want. Right. But, uh, right. 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 Yeah, a lot of it depends on you know what you're trying to do with it anyway. So. Uh, but yeah, it's, you know, similar problem, or rather, you know, same overall problem, but similar approaches. Um, so, anyways, this is the project, and there is their website, Internet in a Box. Um, and so, I'll, I'll uh, clean these up a little bit as well and put those up on the site. So people can look at it. Are there any limitations on the size of the SD card, the capacity of the SD card? Sixty-four. Okay. Um, 64. Adding 64 gigs for the SD card. Um, all right, so that's what I have for this. And uh, yeah. but there's a lot of efforts. I mean, whether it's Rachel or yeah. Internet in the Box, there's another one out of New York called Libraries for All, and they're mm -hmm. creating a content server. Right. So there's a lot of people doing these kind of similar now. similar things. Yeah. Because the cost is. You know, yeah. this stuff is so inexpensive. Yeah. I mean, if you know what you want, you yeah. do it yourself. Yeah. But it's I all about it's curating, 
yeah. data, going and finding the data that's available deciding for free on the internet and deciding, mm -hmm. okay, for the one I'm creating, I'm going to package these things for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think uh, it's important uh, to keep. I think it's important yeah, yeah. to keep in mind that there are two flavors of these things too. One, which is kind of a, a standard, a standalone server like the Rachel on Raspberry Pi, or one of the ways that Internet in the Box is actually supplied. And then some are just supplied as a disk. So Internet in the Box, you can get either way. You can get it as a disk that you would plug into an existing server, or you can get it with server software already on it, and uh, and you would just uh, do it standalone. But of course, you won't get anything else but that server if you do it standalone. Whereas if you plug it into an existing server, you'll get whatever else that server has. Right. Yeah, like that, that drive I was talking about, which has built-in Wi-Fi, you would have everything within that machine, so you would not need a computer to drive it. Um, you know, I'll just add one more thing and kind of hand it over to June, because she's got some exciting stuff from Madagascar. Um, so uh, Anish had gone to the India Project, and he got, he did some interviews the past year or so. Um, so, what is it that you do on the XO they say net? And we use the electrical problem, so it sort of comes and goes. But what's happening? They are actually using the offline content we have. So they think that they don't understand that content. I don't know if that's a good thing, but um, you know, some of the music that they have, they've been listening to that. They've been reading the books. They've been looking at Wikipedia in English and Hindi, uh, and they keep. We do this, we do this. We saw writing that content locally, uh, even if we think yeah. for them it's like it's, it's there. Like, you will see. Madagascar update. Madagascar. Well, after months of inactivity, we have communication from Madagascar. And um, of the seven projects there, I've heard from two. And um, the, the most important one is a school where I have 16 laptops and a connection to the Ministry of Education through the College of Higher Learning. And um, Dr. Hanta. Rasa Manana Anna. I, I'll just call her Dr. Hanta because I can't struggle through her last name. And um, she set up a private school where she's hoping to um, introduce laptops to the children and um, improve their standard of education. It's a private school, and her emphasis is on hygiene as well as education. And the um, the data she's hoping to collect will go to her students um, to produce a master thesis um, on education. And um, she she's working very hard, but she's very discouraged at the level of education of the teachers. So she has to teach the teachers to get them up to speed in order for them to teach the children. But of course, the children using the laptops have moved ahead of their teachers is pretty common and her she's installed showers in the schools and washing machines to um, to keep the kids clean and give them um, clean clothes because she believes that children who are dirty can't learn and so that's that's a, a huge thing for her and she tried to get the teachers to um, have the children wash their hands when they come to school but that that didn't work until the kids were getting the laptop case is dirty with their dirty little fingers and, and now the teachers make the kids wash their hands before they touch the laptops. Uh, yeah. Progress where we can find it. 
Um, they, we have her series of seven books on lemurs on the laptops, and she uses them for the reading lessons. And um, that seems to be working for her. She does 40 minutes per day for each class. And um, the class sizes are between 50 and 70. So we're hoping to increase the number of laptops we have there. Um, I've made con getting them there is a big problem because um, OLPC had problems initially when customs um, snagged the laptops and held them for ransom. And it took weeks and weeks to get them out of out of storage. Um, but I've made contact with the Madagas Chocolate Company that's headquartered um, here in San Francisco and um, in Antananarivo. And they have people that go back and forth to their factory regularly, and they're going to carry laptops for me. And that's that's just happened in the last week. So I'm very pleased about that. And um, I have several projects that were um, set up using the embassy in uh, Madagascar, but I have no connection to them. I send emails and nobody replies, so I have to try and get more more information for, on how I how I can actually reach these um, these people to find out what's going on with the other projects. And I have another project that it seems at the American Embassy. In Madagascar? Yes, the American Embassy. Yeah, and they're not, not responding. They're not responding to my email. So I, I have to find another them. way in. Do you have a telephone number? Um, yes and no, because it it's hit and miss whether you get someone that speaks English answering the phone. It, it's complicated. I understand. Um, but I, I have. I have a connection through a fellow who's in charge of the embassy libraries for East Africa, and uh, I think I'll try and get them through through him. But the other exciting thing is that I've been working with um, a Peace Corps volunteer who's just finished his two-year rotation in Madagascar, and he's been hired by Stony Brook University um, to work on their website and and uh, to teach in their after-school programs and their um, their summer programs in uh, Romana Mafana, which is a preserve that the U.S. Embassy has been very interested in supporting. This uh, volunteer is going back um, to start working in July, and I've already sent him, I think he has nine laptops and a book server, and um, he He's very interested in seeing that the laptops go out to villages um, with content on them. So he's going to help develop um, content to do with conservation, and um, in addition to the educational software that's on the, that are on the um, on the XOs. Right now they have ThinkPads, and he's kind of stuck. Apparently UNICEF provides ThinkPads for. Um, for some of these um, educational projects, but they don't stand up in the um, in that um, moist and dusty environment. So um, anyway, I look forward to working with him, and um, he's technically savvy. So Alex and Samir have been in touch with him, so we're hoping we can make some progress there. That's it. Yeah. Always good to hear back from projects. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't had any any word since October. Yeah. I mean, in some cases, it's just a matter of you know, I think uh, a different time scale we work with. I'm used to getting things done in a certain you know schedule, and then I I sort of give up and despair. And so six months later, somebody writes back and they go, Oh no no, we are still at it. We're just taking our time. Yeah. So Jamaica has been like that. It's like I haven't been back in about a year, maybe less. I should be going back sometime. Anyway. Um, and you know, no word, not a peep, nothing. And then suddenly it's like, oh, there are these people. I remember Nadine; she had come. Yeah. yeah. Um, so she she's sort of taken this on, and they did a training in six schools with sugar, and uh, they're just sort of running with it. And uh, in so many instances now, they they don't tell me what they're doing. I'm like, that's a good thing. Yeah, you, know, uh, you need to run with it. Uh, so yeah, so in some cases it just takes a while. 
these things to happen. I'd like to leave in a few minutes, but I had a question for you. Because, um, you know, Camille, who came last month with the Tanzania project, oh, right, right, right. I'm going to help her get some laptops. And there's one on eBay right now that has a broken screen. Oh, right, right. And right. so the question is, June has one. That We've got a dead 1.75. The yeah. They're all on the same screen. So They're all on the same screen. So if I get this, I'm able to win this yeah, option. Yeah. Spot the sure. And anybody that wants to reach out to Professor Dr. Osmond has two she wants to donate to him. Oh, okay. Yeah. So all the screens are the same, so irrespective of the version, you can swap them out. Okay. Uh, Camille, did you one of these? This is the oh, no, no. Uh, NGO that she's working with. Okay. How much is the eBay um, auction? Right now it's 20. 20. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Keyboard, yeah. Keyboard's yeah. worth that. Yeah. And charger. Anyway, it's almost worth it. Yeah. Charger is what? 15? So, the, yeah, so what? the voters going to leave and our numbers are dwindling. Do we have any uh, update on whether we're going to do the summit this year or not? No, no updates. Update. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, what is it? June, yeah. July, August, September, October. Yeah. Um, one, one, you know, one idea that I threw out there was, um, I, so I, I've been taking oh, part. Thanks. I took part in this uh, Ubuntu. Developer Summit, mm -hmm. uh, so they do this once every six months when they get ready to release a new or work on a new release. And they used to have these face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, they've had one in Mountain View, one in Oakland, um, and now they don't do those. And they do this uh, summit online. So it used to be called Ubuntu Developer Summit. Now they just call it Ubuntu Online Summit. And they have a very nice organization where you have an online schedule. Uh, you click on a session you want to go to. It gives you a page with a YouTube uh, thing embedded there. You know, the Hangout app, for instance, we this is something that anybody can join, but the way they set it up is if there are four people running the session, those four will be on there, um, and anybody else can just watch on YouTube. And then they have a little window below, which runs the IRC channel, where anybody can ask questions. So, you know, they say 10 a.m. Pacific and 10 a.m., you know, four people show up on that little window and then they start off the session, they talk about the stuff, they can share their screens, run their slides, what have you. There's a chat box below there. And this way, you know, they have participation from around the world. And I, so I sat through some of those about a week ago or so. And I was like, you know, I mean, for, for an online thing, it's not bad in that, yes, of course, you don't get to meet a person and you know drink a beer with them, but it's also something where the barrier to participation is very low, mm -hmm. um, and I think you know that's something to explore. Um, which is sure we can still have our face-to-face -face meetings, but given that the numbers have dwindled and we've had trouble last year with you know uh, paying for, for things and not being able to recover, uh, and then space and so on. Um, that's something to consider. Would the Ubuntu people uh, allow us to use their setup? They have a setup on the something, I think it's called Launchpad or something like that, that I believe can be used by others mm -hmm. to set it up as well. But I haven't explored any of that. It was just a, something that occurred to me. It's like, it would be a lot easier for a lot of people to participate in something like that. Um, and, you know, I mean, we'll miss out on the camaraderie. Right, <laughs> but I think we can we can still do that here yeah. with the locals. Yeah. Well, it actually then becomes more global. Yeah. Right, so then then that event actually becomes something where anybody can participate. They'll mm -hmm. just have to wake up in the middle of the night, perhaps. <laughs> um, but so be it, right? I mean, it can be your Walter didn't look too good when he got up in the night <laughs> to deliver his talk in yeah, Paris. So. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's you know. You can see the sun coming up out of his window. <laughs> right. right. Uh, so anyway, I, that's something I threw out to the list, and I got some responses, but you know, I, I'd like to follow up on that a little more. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I don't know what the status is with the space. Um, we got moved to the sixth floor, 
-hmm. It seems there is a conference room that holds about 60, 60 people that I could probably get for Saturday, mm -hmm. but I haven't heard back from them as yet. But Sunday would be nice. Sunday, but they don't have contracts on them. Mm -hmm. They haven't said anything about that. My guess is that we could probably get that room for both Saturday and Sunday. Well, Sunday would be easier than Saturday. Well, Sunday we'll just have to pay like we've done before, but it's a room. It's like one room with, that holds 80 people as opposed to, you know, we used to be able to get the floor. Mm -hmm. So So if we did this, uh, this uh, basically on the, uh, on the web, but we had one room that had room for 60 people, in case for any for all the local people right. who, who wanted to come together, that might be good. Yeah, that's like, a possibility. Which is we we have one location for the local mm -hmm. OPCSF, like everybody mm -hmm. who's here yeah. come there, and then yeah, anybody like in California that wants to right. come up and right. but then run the thing online. Um, yeah, I kind of like that. Yeah, so that that's something that you know I think is worth pursuing. And anybody that wants to come in from abroad, you know, oh, yeah, sure. going to be here anyway or, or wants to come. Uh, I don't think, if we're going to run it as a uh, as a, an internet hangout or whatever the, mm -hmm. the right language is, I would venture yeah. that the number of people would be significantly less, don't you think? So that we yeah, would be I, able to accommodate everybody. Oh, in terms of those who come here. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll show you quickly what I, what I was. And that's at uh, uh, the same location. That's Clifton Mission at Clifton Market. Clifton Market, yeah. Which is just such a fabulous location. So I'll just do a screen share so they can see. Um, have you seen this? Yes. So this is the Ubuntu online summit and so there's a schedule and so you could pick by date or by track. Let's say you picked, I don't know, Cloud DevOps. Um, it will give you all the sessions and you pick one and it gives you this little YouTube thing. So this is already recorded. And there's somebody and, uh, there. So this is a hangout session that they had, mm -hmm. and it's these are the people too. participating right there. Uh, yeah, I just, I just. Added, and then I you could just go in here, add a nickname. Check that out while I'm doing the session. Join um, this IRC thing where oh, you, could you know ask because questions. Someone fast tracked. And then uh, now this is also recorded for later, so you can always go back and listen to it and watch reviews, what the so session was like. But you're not talking about. So you could go pick it up somewhere and then sort of watch this as it happened. Mm -hmm. so, so I think this is worth exploring. Okay. Well, for those two people out there, I guess we'll wrap up the Hangout. Thanks, Mike and Manu, for being online. Thanks, Mike. Bye. Bye, Mike. Bye. All right, Mike. I'll catch up soon. Yeah. So, looks like you got some screenshots and some video stuff, huh? Okay. Okay. Yeah. No worry. All right. Thanks, Mike. Bye bye. bye.